We are in episode six in uh, this series called 1940. In this uh, grand adventure that we are in the middle of, actually closing up because we only have seven parts to this uh, series, we've been sort of witnessing the the rise of Hitler at the same time, it's almost like the fall of Great Britain. Uh, and But at the same time, the reason I wanted to focus on this particular uh, era of history is because when it looks like darkness has the upper hand, and it looks like, if we could say it this way, the good guys are going down, right at that exact time is when the storyline flips. And it's very similar to the storyline of Esther in many ways, where it looks as if the Jews are beaten and Haman has the upper hand, and then boom, on a dime, it seems to switch. And so we're right at that time period where everything is in flux, and we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. Uh, the particular uh, section of history I'm wanting to cover today is in 1940, and it's called the Battle of Britain. And so this, the title makes sense if you know what that battle is, but it's called the power of the air. Of course, that's also a statement that is used in the scriptures to describe uh, the prince of the power of the air is actually the devil himself. And so in this message, that's sort of what it feels like too. It seems like the devil is controlling the air. And before this time, you know, the idea of using aircraft in war was new in World War I and was being defined, and it started out in such a very basic way where it wasn't much of an impact. It was more just almost like a hot air balloon floating over the enemy trying to surveil what the enemy was doing. But then someone came up with the bright idea that they could take a bomb along and just sort of loft it uh, out of the side of the, of the plane. And uh, voila, we begin to see the transformation of thinking, militarily speaking, of what could be done with air power. And by this time in history, uh, the air is everything. And if you control the air, you win the war. And you know what I just said there is very, very important in the spiritual ideas, which is, of course, my main focus uh, in what I'm teaching. I'm not really trying to just teach history. I want to teach the Christian life. And whoever controls the air, whoever controls the atmosphere of ideas, wins the war. And whoever controls the air in your own life is winning the battle. If it's the devil and you're believing his lies, you're believing the cultural inputs, then he will dominate your life. However, if the storyline changes and the truth of the word of God begins to control the air, everything shifts on a dime. So part six, the power of the air. On the screen, I have a statement. In an age of pending doom, and that's what it felt like, and since none of us lived through this time, we, we don't know exactly what it felt like, but in all the descriptions, it was a very dire time for those in Great Britain. Uh, you have many people that were uh, pondering how to get out of the country, if there's any escape, uh, if there's any way to die quickly instead of die painfully at the hand of the Nazis. Various thoughts were creeping into the culture of Great Britain. And there was also something in the works, and I say it on the screen, it says Operation Sea Lion is currently in the works. Operation Sea Lion is an operation of the uh, the German military to cross the English Channel and to invade the shores of Great Britain, something that hadn't been done in a thousand years. And so the fact that this is actually a possibility, especially considering Great Britain is known for having the greatest navy, and, and so if they have the greatest navy in the world, how could Germany possibly pull this off? But at this point in time, you begin to feel that the Great, great Britain and their once significant advantage over Germany has totally not just evaporated, but now has totally switched the other way so that Germany has the advantage. And if there were Las Vegas odds makers at this time, they have Germany winning uh, Operation Sea Lion by probably four touchdowns. That's how severe uh, the situation looked for Great Britain. There's a character named Philip Patan who was uh, the marshal over uh, France at the time, and uh, he made a statement when he capitulated to Hitler and basically gave up France, and that's a whole saga in, in history that I'm not covering here. But he made the statement, in three weeks, England will have her neck wrung like a chicken. 
And there's not a lot of argument to that. Uh, there was uh, the diplomats that were there from the United States were coming back to Roosevelt in America and giving him counsel on what he should do. Should he step in? Should he somehow come to the aid of England in this time? And his advisors, his diplomats that were seeing the scene on the ground said, no, Great Britain is done for. They don't have any hope in this battle, so you might as well not waste any of America's resources in trying to help her. And so that was the common sentiment of the day. And you could understand why, if you were in Great Britain, you wouldn't be feeling very confident at this exact moment. You know, so if we were to take that same dynamic, I think many of us have felt that. Uh, those of us that esteem the Word of God, that cherish Jesus Christ as our Lord, we fall into a very unique uh, perspective over the past years where, you know, starting with the COVID movement, it started long before that, but COVID sort of brought it to the surface where you begin to feel like our world is quickly unraveling and things are taking a decided turn against a biblical worldview or someone who holds a mentality that esteems Jesus Christ, that esteems the integrity of his word, that believes that his word is just as accurate today as it was 2,000 years ago. And so something has happened, and we feel that. We feel that change of climate. And almost like this movement of the Nazis towards the English Channel, and you almost sense that they're hatching a Operation Sea Lion to invade the shores. And so even though we haven't walked through this exact situation, I think many of us have felt it, at least at some basic level, which is why I think this message is important. The sound of pending doom, the evil hum of the Luftwaffe. So when you describe it uh, in that time period, all the different uh, British people that would describe this pending doom, this sense of doom that was coming, it had a hum sound to it. The Luftwaffe was the German Air Force, and when it would come, it would have a zzz sort of hum on the horizon. And so that was sort of the same thing. It's the, uh, the announcement that the enemy is coming and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. And you made a lot, and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So one of the things that Paul is clarifying is that each of us that has been made alive once was dead, and we once lived under the control of this one known as the prince of the power of the air. And But something has shifted in us. We are no longer ruled by this one who is the prince of the power of the air. And this spirit of darkness no longer rules in us because no longer are we sons of disobedience. Something has shifted. And we need to remember, just like Great Britain needed to remember in that time, that we have an air force too. We have something that is meant to go into this same air and combat what the enemy is doing. It's interesting because when you go to the thought life of a Christian or a believer, in the modern days, many of us feel just subjected, like we don't have a choice. The enemy speaks and we have to listen. But that is not a truth. The truth is the enemy can jabber all day long. He can yammer, uh, you know, till the, the cock crows uh, tomorrow morning, and it doesn't make any difference. What he says does not need to influence you. You are meant to be controlled in your mind by something different than the prince of the power of the air. So even though there's an evil hum in the distance, and that evil hum is saying, I'm coming for you, that evil hum is saying, yes, and I'm carrying many bombs uh, along with me to blast uh, you away, we do not need to give way to anxiety and fear in this situation. And so the study of Great Britain in the midst of this extraordinary battle of the air is quite impressive, actually. So there's a picture of the German Luftwaffe, and I'm calling them the evil hum. And uh, they were a very impressive air force. But there was an air force that was even more impressive. And I would love to say that about the kingdom of heaven today, is that the air force and the power of our God in the air is greater than the power of the enemy. However, right now on paper, it sure does look weaker, doesn't it? And I think many of us have struggled with that. God, where are you? God, do you hear our prayers? Oh, he does. 
and he is coming. He will actually enter this engagement in a way that demonstrates who he is. And that greater power in World War II was called the Royal Air Force, or the RAF, and I'm going to call them the answer to the evil hum. And that is something that we need to know in our own life, spiritually. Is there an answer to this evil hum, this pending doom that seems to be humming on the horizons of our life and tries to distract us from the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. So it's called the Battle of Britain or the Battle in the Air. The whole battle was actually in the air. It's the most prolonged and complicated air campaign in history. Uh, over three and a half months in length, from July 10th, 1940 to October 31st, 1940. This is going to be the defining test of Great Britain. Many of us have gone through a battle of, of Britain where it seems for a season that the enemy is very noisy, and no matter how many times we pray, he seems to get louder. It's sort of like Paul with his thorn, where he prays three times, and it seems like it's still persisting. And yet, what you see in the life of Paul is not defeat. You actually see the grace of God actually increasing in and through him. The same thing is going to happen in Great Britain in and through this time. This was meant to break down the British people. They were going to be hit and hit and hit again by the German Luftwaffe, bombed day in and day out, where they could not really get a good night's uh, sleep for months on end. And every day, you have no idea. They're not very accurate at this time in history to be able to uh, bomb. It was more accurate than World War I, but still not very accurate. And so that lack of accuracy is rather disconcerting to you as a citizen who's just sort of hanging out in your home, wondering if a stray bomb could hit you. And so as a result, you feel like your life is hanging in the balance at every passing moment of every passing day. So during this, we're going to see Great Britain, instead of break down mentally, we're going to see them steal themselves mentally and become stronger. And I'm just going to tell you that this is exactly what is supposed to happen in us as believers. I had a whole season of my life where the devil came at me with, I'll call it a battle of the Britain uh, sort of uh, attack where it was nonstop. And it was on the issue, I've always called it diminishment, where he was just like so noisy in my life saying, give up, give up, you're nothing. No one wants to hear this anyways. And it was a really challenging season for me. It lasted actually three years. I'm not trying to discourage any of you by, by hearing a story like that, but it's one of the most defining seasons of my life. In the first year, I, I remember just pleading with God to stop whatever this was. In the, in the second year, I remember having the clear, and this probably happened before a year, but having the clear understanding that this wasn't from God. This voice was actually an enemy voice, and I had authority against it. And so I began to grow in my resistance to this voice to the point where in that third year, it could make whatever noise it wanted, and it was nonstop. And I literally didn't hear it. It didn't affect my thinking anymore. It lost its power over me because it lost the power of the air in my life. And actually, still to this day, I look back at that stretch, and I see what it did to strengthen me. That when we actually bring in our own air force or the strength of God's word to bear on this situation, it is written. We have something very, very powerful to deal with the enemy's voice. And if we use it, it actually strengthens us, even if at first it seems like that voice persists. It's like, how come he doesn't just going away? When Jesus said it is written, the enemy was just silenced. Well, technically the enemy came back with more questions even after that. And so I think for us to recognize that even if something doesn't immediately go away, keep addressing it with your own Royal Air Force. Keep giving what God has given you. Keep delivering the word of God in authority, in the, the authority of the name of Jesus, and you will see a shift in this battle. The results of the tireless resistance. It's an incredible reality, but Hitler was cowed. Here's this weaker nation, and they have nothing really to, to give back. Uh, all they can do is defend themselves. However, their tireless resistance scared Hitler to the point where he's actually going to cancel Operation Sea Lion. This whole thing was setting the place. He had everything on the shores of France ready to invade England. However, Great Britain's response to this sent a tremble down his spine. 
And I think that's exactly what we want to do today. We want that prince of the power of, of the air to recognize that the Royal Air Force that we have is, is stronger than what he has. And we want him to know that we mean business as the Church of Jesus Christ. We remember our heritage. We remember the purchase of the cross. We remember that we're redeemed. We remember the seated position of our Lord. And we remember that we are in Christ in that seated position. So here's Winston Churchill. He's speaking of the, Brit- the Royal Air Force. Uh, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. That's a famous quote from Winston Churchill about the Royal Air Force. Let me, I'm just going to read it again because it's just such a great quote. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. How an air campaign works. The enemy hums in hopes that you will listen. You see, the goal of an enemy air attack is actually more psychological than it is anything else, and especially in this time period of history. Because what he wants is to breed fear. He wants to breed such discontent in the hearts and the minds of the British that they plead with their politicians to give up and put up the white flag. In other words, he's trying to cow them. When in actuality, when you respond to the enemy's cowing techniques with fearlessness, which is what's going to happen here, it's an extraordinary story, it actually ends up cowing the very one that's trying to scare you. And that is a biblical principle too. In other words, when we show fearlessness, it strikes terror in our enemy. The fire brigades, dousing the flames produced by the air attack. So these, this attack was just nonstop, and it created fires all, all over London. London was just the main target. It was just being obliterated. And so they created these things called fire brigades. And I wish I had more time to go into the fire brigades because they're extremely fun and interesting. Here's just a couple pictures. There's a whole sector of British society that trained up to actually be on the ready in every zone, in every place, uh, to be able to immediately see a fire, announce the fire, and then get a crew, a fire brigade there to put out the fire. Uh, pretty amazing system. And so you even see from the water, uh, I forgot what it was, but it was like 140 gallons a second those things could or, uh, could pump out. Maybe it was every minute, I, I don't know. But it was, it's, it was a pretty great system to utilize the water and from a boat actually uh, use it to douse flames. And uh, so here's Winston Churchill again. Large-scale systems of training were developed to teach the fire watchers how to deal with the various kinds of incendiaries which were used against us. Many became adept and thousands of fires were extinguished before they took hold. The experience of remaining on the roof night after night under fire with no protection but a tin hat soon became habitual. Do you imagine if bombs were dropping around you and you're like standing on the roof? You're not in the bomb shelter. You're standing on the roof watching for fires. And all you have for your protection is a tin hat. And yet this is what Britain did. They all sort of gathered together. It was a great honor to be able to stand on the top of a roof while bombs were falling and watch for fires. They were called fire watchers. Isn't that a great statement? And in the Church of Jesus Christ, for us to become familiar with the different, in Winston Churchill's words, it says, for the, with, to become familiar with the various kind of incendiaries which were used against us. I think it's important for us to become familiar with the different kind of incendiaries, the things that start fires in our own soul that the enemy uses against us and becoming an expert in his tactics. Not that we want to study the enemy himself. We want to know what he's up to so that we can effectively address it with the truth. The name Civil Defense Service was substituted for the pre-war title of Air Raid Precautions, or ARP. Good good uniforms were provided for large numbers, and they became conscious of being a fourth arm of the crown. I love this statement from Winston Churchill. London could take it. They took all they got and could have taken more. Indeed, at this time, we saw no end but the demolition of the whole metropolis— I would love to substitute some different words in there. You know, we could say the church could take it. They took all they got and could have taken more. I would also like for you to experiment with sticking your own name in there. You know, Eric Ludy could take it. He took all they got or he took all he got. You see, is that something that you desire to be true about you? that you become stronger in and through the difficulties as opposed to weaker. The enemy has an agenda 
to weaken you, to cow you, and to get, have you give way to fear and anxiety and to throw up the white flag and just say, just, just take over. However, the kingdom of heaven is built of different stuff. It is built in this way, sort of like London was in 1940, that it is actually going to awaken from its stupor and remember its purpose, that it has been given a grand role in, in history to stand up against this evil and to do something about it. However, the first step is not to be cowed by the evil. And even when that evil is dishing out those incendiary bombs, that they end up laughing back. And that's exactly what London is going to do. Is that all you got? Is that all you got here? Meanwhile, London is in rubble around them. And yet they're, they're looking back at Germany saying, is that all you got? And there's something so inspiring to me in and through this to recognize that spiritually, this is how we function. The power, the powers of the enemy, the devil, have hatched schemes to try and cow us to try and coerce us into throwing up the white flag and giving up our position of strength. However, the key for us as believers is to not be cowed, but to become strong, not in some weird defiance towards the world systems, but towards the enemy systems. The devil does not deserve any kindness from us. He deserves a swift rebuke. He deserves the, a resistance from our inner man so that we say no to his schemes and his desires to bring us under his boot. Winston Churchill continues, on the night of November 3, for the first time in nearly two months, no alarm sounded in London. The silence seemed quite odd to many. They wondered what was wrong. On the following night, the enemy's attacks were widely dispersed throughout the island, and this continued for a while. There had been another change in the policy of the German offensive. They would have done much better to have stuck to one thing at a time and pressed it to a conclusion, but they were already baffled and for the time being unsure of themselves. The vigilant Christian, I'm going to call them the fire brigade. We sort of need a fire brigade in the Church of Jesus Christ. Dousing the flames produced by the air attack. There are a lot of tactics the enemy has that many of us are unaware of. And he tries to play us against each other, you know, Christian against Christian. Of course, that's a, a classic uh, thing. But there are a lot of little small things that he will do. He'll try and bait us towards us to start little miniature fires because a miniature fire untended grows into a bigger fire. It's just the principle of fire. So he doesn't care if he's only smart, uh, starting small fires. What he wants is to start small fires that are untended. You see, the, the great problem for the enemy is when we become fire watchers. Even in our own soul, you see, we will have compromise. We will make mistakes, even though we have grace to not do it. Let's start with the premise that, okay, let's say we make a mistake. Let's say we have a misstep. Well, guess what? Instead of just excusing that and allowing a small fire to begin, we immediately become a fire watcher and douse it. It's like, no, you see, that's what we have grace for. You see, we are being made perfect. In the process of being made perfect, we're going to have imperfect moments. In those imperfect moments, small fires could be started, and that's the enemy's business. That's why he doesn't give up on us when we come to Christ. We could say, well, I'm a believer. Why is he still tempting me? It's because he's trying to start small fires, which can grow into bigger ones. He wants to take you off your game. He does not want you to recognize your, inher your inheritance, to remember your strength and your authority. He wants to cow you. Even though in our minds we're thinking, but that's impossible. How could he cow a believer in Christ? Well, unfortunately, many of us know the answer to that because it's happened to us personally. You see, he works through small anxieties and small fears to grow them into bigger ones. He works through small pride to grow it into bigger pride. He works through small lusts to grow them into bigger lusts. He is an expert at starting fires. He wants to bring us under his control, and he wants to do it in small measure if we are a believer that is awake. And so let's stand on the rooftops, guys. Let's not be in our bomb shelters. Let's remember the word of God. Let's remember the authority that we've been given, and let's, wh let's whip it out and use it in this time period. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. These words are very, very strong words in the Greek too. 
pulling down strongholds. That's like yanking, dismantling, casting down arguments. It's like throwing something to the ground. And so what we have is we have this idea of a very actively engaged Royal Air Force that even though the Luftwaffe you know, has its strongholds, has its arguments, has its things that exalts itself over the, and against the knowledge of God, we have been given weaponry. We've been given an, a Royal Air Force that if we will employ or deploy it in this situation, send it up to fight, you will see that it will actually win the battle of the air. We have been given the strength, we have been given the grace to win in this key battle. However, we as believers must know that. It is essential that we recognize who actually is intended to rule the air. So here's a picture. We have Great Britain and the United Kingdom as a whole uh, on a, on a, in a picture. And then we have to the right or to my right, we have the, the German Luftwaffe and to the, other, to the left, uh, the Royal Air Force. And they're fighting for a territory. Now, that territory could be the nations of this earth. And that's a very real picture. The enemy is fighting to take hold of the nations of this earth. But God has a Royal Air Force that is designed to actually combat the enemy's aims. You could look at that as the church of Jesus Christ as a whole. And it would be an accurate picture that the enemy has a design to dismantle, to undermine, to divide, to create denominational difference and argument amongst us. And we have weapons of warfare that are actually able to overcome that. This could be your marriage. This could be your family. You see, the enemy has a design. He wants to cow you. He wants you to give up. He wants you to throw up the white flag and just allow him to rule over you. However, you've been given weapons that are stronger than what he is coming against you with. The, the key is you must know that, and then you must begin to implement those weapons. One of the key ones is prayer. It's interesting, but prayer is a very odd form of military uh, work because you can't see it. You know, you're lofting a bomb into the air or a missile, and yet you can't quite measure its trajectory. You can't see the explosion on the end, other end always. The weapons of our warfare are different. They're not of the world, which is why Paul is going to say they're not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. When we walk in obedience, when we rejoice when we're falsely accused, when, we, when we're weak, we become strong, when we yield to the grace of God, and when we pray, these are weapons. All of these things that I'm mentioning are actions of the Christian soul that actually dismantle the enemy's plans, that actually undermine his kingdom. And so when we wield them, it's like sending up our Royal Air Force. It will come back victorious. Proverbs 1, verse 10, 15, 23, and then 33. My son, if sinners entice you, listen to this, do not consent. What an amazing statement in the Old Testament right there. You see, if you are enticed to fear, to anxiety, to pride, to lust, <laughs> you could you know fill in the blank there. Do not consent. Isn't that sound a little pat, a little overly simplistic? However, in the new covenant, we have authority to literally resist the devil and he will flee. We must know our position in Christ. So this is said to all of us, my son or O oh church, if sin entices you, do not consent. Do not let him have his way. Do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Oh, isn't that what we need too in this time of battle? We need the word of God known. And so when he corrects us and says to us, Great Britain, you've given up your military strength, but I want you to know I'm still here. And if you call on me, I will heal your land. If you humble yourself and turn and seek me and you pray, I will hear that prayer and I will do on your behalf what no man could do for you. Whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. It's quite a statement in the midst of a world that seems very full of evil but the concept of not fearing evil means we do not fear that it will ever have the upper hand over our life, over our soul. It cannot change us. 
You see, we are held in the hollow of God's hand. Therefore, we do not fear what the enemy can do to us. We know that those with us are greater than those with him. We know that nothing can possibly stand against us when we stand with Jesus Christ. We know that no weapon that is fashioned against us shall prosper. You see, these are the basis points of our fearless living. We do not heed that hum of the enemy when the Luftwaffe begins to uh, edge the horizon. But we remember the hum of our God's army. We remember the hum of the Royal Air Force. We remember our King, his victory on the cross, the merits of his shed blood. We remember his ascension to the right hand of majesty. We remember his seated position and that all things are beneath his feet. We remember the truth. And when we remember the truth, the truth sets us free. The truth nullifies the plans of the enemy with his Operation Sea Lion to invade our shorelines. The enemy does have a design. He does actually have a scheme to destroy us. However, God has a scheme and a design to destroy him. Let's remember that our God is greater.